This is the year in wrestling, 1988, part three. This is part three in my series on 1988, I'm talking about WWF and the NWA only. Before I talk about SummerSlam 88, I'm going to talk about something that happened very tragic, very shocking in wrestling in 1988. July, July 16th, Bruiser Brody was murdered in Puerto Rico. He was stabbed to death. I believe it was after a wrestling show. And I know he was stabbed in the shower or in the locker room. Bruiser Brody was stabbed to death. And of course, he was stabbed to death. It says at a show at a stadium in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Jose Gonzalez is charged with the murder of Bruiser Brody but later he was acquitted of the murder why was he acquitted I don't know I don't have a clue he should have not been acquitted if if he murdered him and if they arrested him the first time and they thought he murdered Bruiser Brody then he should have been charged with murder and he should still be in jail to this day. Right now, he should still be in jail, but he's not. I don't even know if Jose Gonzalez is still alive. And I don't really care. Very, very tragic to lose Bruiser Brody like that. To just to be stabbed to death. To be murdered. Nobody should be murdered to have their life end by being murdered that's sick that's disgusting and Bruiser Brody was a great he was a great one in pro wrestling he was a superstar he was a big star in Japan he was a big star in the United States <clears throat> he made a lot of money in uh, St. Louis territory he made a lot of money he worked for the WCCW against Abdullah the Butcher. He worked he worked everywhere. He worked in the AWA. He worked in the NWA. He worked in uh, St. Louis, as I said, Puerto Rico. He worked a lot in Puerto Rico. He worked a lot in Japan. Bruiser Brody was a legend and is a legend. Is an all time great and it's very disgusting that he was murdered. And the person that murdered him was not charged. And they didn't catch the person. And if Jose Gonzalez did do it and they thought he did it, he should have never been acquitted. Very disgusting. July 16th, 1988, Bruiser Brody was murdered. Now I'm going to talk about... SummerSlam 1988. SummerSlam 88 was the next pay-per-view of the WWF that the WWF put on after WrestleMania 4. SummerSlam was the fourth, I mean the third big show of the year. Back then in 88 you had Royal Rumble. Wasn't a pay-per-view yet but it was a big show. 89, you had the four big main shows. Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. Back in the late 80s were the big shows. Four big ones. And SummerSlam is still a big show. To this day, SummerSlam is probably the number two biggest pay-per-view of the year. Right behind WrestleMania. First match on SummerSlam 88, which is right here. SummerSlam 88 DVD. I own it. It's a great show. 
a lot of matches on it like 13 or 14 plus matches are on SummerSlam 88 it's a huge show it was the first SummerSlam it was at Madison Square Garden in New York City first match was the British Bulldogs against the Rougeo brothers entertaining tag match it was a fun tag match to watch and the British Bulldogs and the Rougeau brothers battled to a 20 minute to a time limit draw match win 20 minutes so it ended in a draw up next was Bad News Brown against Ken Patera very boring match crowd was not really into it I wasn't into it Bad News Brown, Ken Patera uh, I'm sorry but I don't care about them too I was never a fan of them anyways Bad News Brown defeated Ken Patera in 6 minutes 33 seconds up next was Ravishing Rick Rude, the great, the late great Rick Rude, taking on JYD Junkyard Dog, and Rick Rude defeated Junkyard Dog by disqualification. I believe Jake the Snake Roberts ran into the ring, did a run in, attacked Rick Rude during the match. Of course, JYD was DQ'd. Rick Rude came in, beat the hell out of Rick Rude. Jake the Snake came in, beat the hell out of Rick Rude. DQ finish. He might have DDT'd him. I don't remember. But at the time, Jake the Snake really, really was in a heated feud with Rick Rude at the time. That's why he interfered. And Rick Rude wins by DQ. Up next was the Powers of Pain, their first WWF pay-per-view for the Powers of Pain, defeating, yeah, defeating the Bolsheviks in 5 minutes and 17 seconds. Up next, the Honky Tonk Man came out, made an open challenge for anybody to challenge him for the Intercontinental title. At the time of SummerSlam 88, Honky Tonk Man was a champion for well over a year. I believe 14 months Honky Tonk Man was the Intercontinental Champion for. He won it in, uh, I believe, June of 87 and at SummerSlam 88. August 88, he was still Intercontinental Champ. And Summer Sam took place on August 29th of 88. Anyways, Honky Tonk Man basically got on the microphone and said, I don't care who it is, anybody back there, come on out and challenge me. It can be anybody, I don't care. And basically he called out anybody from the back to come out and challenge him for the Intercontinental title. And then you had the ultimate warrior and his music hit. And, and when his music hit, it was epic. You had a huge warrior got a huge pop. He ran down to the ring, basically started punching Honky Tonk Man, beating the hell out of him. And the Honky Tonk Man did not know what hit him. He did not know who was coming. He did not know what was coming. And what came down to the ring was a warrior. And the warrior beat the hell out of him. And the honky tonk man did not even get his jump suit off. And the warrior defeated him in 28 seconds. He beat honky tonk man. And the ultimate warrior was the new intercontinental champion. And that really, really put the warrior over winning that quick and that fast against the honky tonk man that claimed for the entire time he was the intercontinental champion he said every interview he was the greatest intercontinental champ of all time everybody 
nobody thought I nobody could beat Honky Tonk Man for that title for 14 months. And then you have the Warriors music hit in Madison Square Garden. Basically, MSG is the home of the WWE. And uh, Warrior made a huge impact by beating Honky Tonk Man in 28 seconds. He made a huge impact and he basically kick-started his career. And he was basically a main, main top superstar after beating Honky Tonk Man and becoming Intercontinental Champ Warrior became a superstar and that was great how that match put him over just by winning in 28 seconds he became even more over with the crowd up next was uh Dino Bravo defeated Don Morocco in five minutes, and it was pretty boring. I didn't care for the match. I thought it was boring. Tag Team Championship. Up next, Tag Team Titles on the line. Demolition defending against the Hart Foundation, Bret Hart and Jim the Anvil Nightheart. It was a good Good tag match, very entertaining, old school tag team wrestling. You had a lot of great teams in the 80s, in the WWF, and Demolition and the Hart Foundation were the two very top tag teams at the time in the WWF, and they were going at it for the tag titles in MSG at the first SummerSlam, and the Demolition defeated the Hart Foundation and retained the tag team titles. Up next, the big boss man making his pay-per-view WWF pay-per-view debut defeating Coco Beware in 5 minutes 57 seconds. It wasn't a very long match at all, but it was a damn entertaining match. You had uh, Coco Beware and the Boss Man. They absolutely brought it. It was very entertaining. The very short time they were given, they brought it. And they made an entertaining match out of very little time. Boss Man wins. I believe he used the Boss Man Slam. That Sidewalk Slam is finishing maneuver to beat Coco. Up next, you had Jake the Snake Roberts defeat Hercules in a very pointless match. Win 10 minutes, and basically, Jake and Hercules were on the show because the WWF just wanted to put them on the show, probably give give them a payday. Jake the Snake wins. I don't know why he was in a match with Hercules. It was pretty pointless. But Jake wins. And I believe that after Jake won, Rick Rude might have came out to the ring. Might have came out, ran in the ring and attacked uh, Rick Rude. I'm not sure if Rick Rude really came down and attacked him, but I think he might have. Up next, you had the main event of SummerSlam 88. The Mega Powers, Macho Man, Randy Savage, and Hulk Hogan defeated Ted DiBiase and Andre the Giant. Special referee was Jesse the Body Ventura. Anyways, the Mega Powers defeated Ted and Andre in 13 minutes and 57 seconds that was SummerSlam 88 it was pretty damn pretty good show I don't know if it was better than uh, WrestleMania 4 but SummerSlam 88 it was a pretty good show and there were a couple matches on it 
that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed the main event, Mega Powers against Andre and Ted. I enjoyed the tag title match. Demolition versus Heart Foundation was great. Wasn't the best tag match they've had, but it was good. And I enjoyed Warrior winning the Intercontinental title. That was a great moment, very memorable. And uh, I enjoyed Coco, Beware, and the Boss Man was also very good. Up next, I'm going to talk about this, the Andre and Hacksaw Jim Duggan feud. You had Hacksaw Jim Duggan at the time basically challenged Andre on Superstars of Wrestling in the ring. Andre had the microphone, or Hacksaw got on the microphone. Basically challenged Andre. Andre thought it was a joke. Went like this. Told uh, Jim Duggan basically get out of my face. You're a, you're a nobody. You're a nothing. And then Hacksaw cracked Andre over the head with his 2x4. Knocked out the giant on superstars. Cracked him in the skull. Andre fell over on his back. And he's basically knocked out. So that really put Duggan over. With the fans doing that to Andre, knocking him out, that really helped Jim Duggan and his career in the WWF. And they had a little mini feud. Andre and uh, Hacksaw had two matches that were very memorable at the Boston Garden in August of 88. They had a one on one match, and it was pretty damn entertaining. Andre could not do much at all in those matches all he basically did was chop kick punch headbutt uh, put hacks up against the turnbuckles back into him with his big ass he basically used backing in them crushing them so hacks couldn't breathe that's all Andre was good for he wasn't good for much of wrestling at all in his feud with Hacksaw, he didn't wrestle, he couldn't move, I'm sure he was in a lot of pain, and his back, but he continued wrestling, I guess he continued because he loved the business, and he didn't want to quit, and I'm sure he was making a lot, a lot of money that Vince was paying Andre to stay around because he was a draw. He was a giant, and people paid to see Andre wrestle. People, not wrestle, but people basically. Andre was an attraction. He was a special attraction, and that's why he stayed around in 88, in 89, and part of 1990. And then you had a match right on this video, best of the W. WF Volume 17, best of the WWF, you had a very f cool match, very entertaining, you had Andre against Hacksaw, Jim Duggan in a lumberjack match in the Boston Garden, there's a picture of Andre, anyways, that lumberjack match was very entertaining to watch, and it was cool. And it was done very well. As I said, Andre could not move much or do much of anything in his matches. But it was good for Hacksaw to be in a feud with Andre. It helped out Jim Duggan for sure. And it pushed him for sure and got him over with the fans. And I'm sure that's what WWF wanted. They wanted Andre to help get over Hacksaw and it worked. Up next, I'm going to talk about the Pro Wrestling Illustrated winners of the year for 1988. If I can get the freaking page. Pro Wrestling Illustrated winners, wrestler of the year for 1988 was Randy Macho Man Savage.
very well deserved. He won the title. He won the tournament at WrestleMania 4. Glad he was named Wrestler of the Year by Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Randy Savage, Wrestler of the Year in 1988. Tag Team of the Year for 1988 was the Road Warriors. They became the NWA Tag Champs in 1988 when they defeated the Midnight Express. I believe at a house show in New Orleans. And uh, so there's your tag team of the year, Road Warriors for 1988. Match of the year for 1988 was Hawk Hogan and Andre the Giant from the main event where Andre won the WWF title. Basically, Hogan was screwed and there were two twin brothers, referees, the Hebner brothers, basically showed up and it was a big storyline. Ted DiBiase basically screwed Hogan and bought himself the WWF title. Hogan and Andre main event February, might have been February 4th. I don't have the exact date, but it was February of 88, Hogan versus Andre for the title was the match of the year. Feud of the year, Pro Wrestling Illustrated picked Ric Flair versus Lex Luger as the feud of the year in the NWA, Luger had a title match at the Great American Bash, 88, against Ric Flair. It was a good match. Flair brought the best out in Luger. And then they had another title match at Starcade with Lex and Flair in another good title match. Most popular wrestler of the year for 80, in 1988. Most popular was Randy Macho Man Savage. Well deserved. I can dig that. Ooh yeah. Most hated wrestler of the year. For 1988 was Andre the Giant. And I agree. Every arena he went in. He was basically booed out of the building. Most improved wrestler of the year for 88 was Sting. And I agree. He had that epic match with Ric Flair on the first Clash of Champions. Win 45 minutes to a draw. Basically got Sting over. And in 1988 Sting was really, really improved. And he got better and better and better in the ring in 88 and he got even better in 89 and in 1990. Most inspirational wrestler of the year for 88 was Jerry the King Lawler. Rookie of the year for 88 was Medusa. She was in the AWA at the time, so Medusa won the Rookie of the Year for 88. Comeback of the Year. Uh, my bad. Comeback of the Year did not start until 1992. Manager of the Year for 1988 went to J.J. J. Dillon. Manager of the Four Horsemen, J.J. Dillon really was a great fit and a great, he was really good in the Four Horsemen. He could talk on the mic. He was a great manager. He was a great heel. So J.J. Dillon well deserved the winning manager of the year in 88. So those are your PWI Pro Wrestling Illustrated winners. For 1988, ladies and gentlemen. 
Now I'm going to talk about Jake the Snake and Rick Rude and their mini feud they had in 1988. It all started on a Superstars of Wrestling in the summer of 88 when Rick Rude basically wanted to pick a woman. He, he would pick women out of the audience to kiss him in the ring. And I'm sure they were all set up and the women knew ahead of time they were going to be picked because the WWE probably let them know and asked them if they wanted to be kissed by Rick Root on TV and they probably agreed. So I'm sure it was all set up. Anyways, Rick Root wanted to kiss Jake, the snake's wife, and she was sitting in the front row and he was, he really really wanted to kiss her and basically started getting really angry and yelling at her on the microphone saying what's your problem honey why don't you want to kiss ravishing Rick Rude and she didn't want to kiss Rick Rude because as we all found out Jake the Snake ran down to the ring started beating the hell out of Rick Rude Rick Rude ran off basically because Jake the Snake was defending his wife that was his wife sitting in the front row that Rick Rude wanted to kiss and tried to kiss. Grabbed her by her wrist, basically, and I think he was squeezing her wrist or he was just grabbing her wrist trying to make her kiss him. Jake the Snake was pissed off. He was fighting for his wife and her honor. So then the feud kicked off from there. You had... Jake the Snake's wife basically accompanied him to the ringside after this happened a lot. She came down to ringside with her husband, Jake the Snake, and the feud kicked off from there. Cheryl Roberts was by her husband's side, Jake the Snake Roberts. They had a lot of matches all over the country. They had a pretty damn good match at Madison Square Garden. In October, I think it was October of 88, and it's on, the, it's on the Jake the Snake Pick Your Poison DVD. You can check that match out, Jake the Snake versus Rick Rude from Madison Square Garden. They had a very good match in Milwaukee, July 31st, 88 at WWF WrestleFest. From County Stadium, Jake the Snake, Rick Rude had a match there. It was a very good match. And uh, I enjoyed the Rick Rude and Jake the Snake feud. I thought it was good, and I thought it was some good story. A good storyline was involved, and it was cool to see those two guys work and have a feud together. I'm a big fan of Jake the Snake. He is one of the greatest of all time at cutting promos and doing interviews and I'm a big Rick Rude fan very sad he passed away I wish Rick Rude was still alive and uh, I hope Rick Rude gets in the Hall of Fame very soon because he deserves it for damn sure up next I'm going to talk about Clash of the Champions 3 that happened. Clash of Champions 3 was September 7th, 88. Good. Brad Armstrong. Brad Armstrong and Mike Rutundo wrestled to a time limit draw. Then you had Steve Dr. Death Williams and Nikita Koloff defeat. The Bushwhackers, at the time, they were not known as the Bushwhackers, but you know their name, and they were, at, they were in Clash of Champions 3, and Steve Williams and Nikita Koloff defeated them. Dusty Rhodes defeated Kevin Sullivan by DQ when Al Perez and Gary Hart attacked Dusty Rhodes so Dusty wins by DQ. 
Ricky Morton defeated Ivan Koloff in a Russian chain match. I don't remember this match at all being a Russian chain match. I barely remember it. And uh, I'll have to check it out on the network. Clash of Champions 3, Ricky Morton against Ivan Koloff in a Russian chain match. I don't remember it, but I'm sure it happened. Then the main event, I'm not sure it was the main event, but it's the last match listed on this show, on the show, in this book. Sting defeated Barry Windham by DQ. And I'm sure the four horsemen got involved or else it would have not ended in a DQ Sting against Barry Windham. Clash of Champions 3 main event. Not very many matches on Clash of Champions 3. It was not very memorable to me. I don't even remember the show or watching it. But um, I'm sure it was a decent show. It was Clash of Champions 3, but I don't remember it. Anyways, that's, that is my the end of part 3. Of the year in wrestling 1988. I will do part 4. In a couple days. I will talk about. Some more. Uh, yeah. One more clash of champions. Happened in 88. And December. 7th. Was a clash of champions 4. I will also talk about. Starcade 88. And I will also talk about Survivor Series 88 pay-per-views on the next show, Part 4, The Year in Wrestling, 1988. Anybody out there that watched this, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Follow me on Twitter at TNA WWE Guy. I'm Justin. I run that account. I tweet all the time. Just about every Monday Night Raw, just about every SmackDown, every NXT, every TNA, Friday Night Show, every pay-per-view that's on the WWE Network. I tweet about it live. A lot of UFC pay-per-views I tweet about. If I'm interested in any of the fights, I will watch it and tweet about it and get the fight. Um, I will be tweeting about ROH has a pay-per-view in June, I believe. I could be wrong, but I think they have a pay-per-view in June. I will be tweeting about uh, TNA Slammiversary has a pay-per-view in June. So basically, if you're watching this, you must enjoy my tweets. And you must like me on Twitter or be entertained by my tweets if you're watching my videos thanks I appreciate it a lot uh, I love my followers and who's ever watching this video thank you and whoever watched any of my videos thank you very much bye for now have a good week everybody